Hello and welcome to the PBS Adult Learning Satellite Service and this edition of its continuing program entitled Author Author. I am Harvey Stedman, the Dean of the School of Continuing Education at New York University and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the NYU campus today for a conversation with the authors of the new book, The Politics of Education, Conflict and Consensus on Capitol Hill, Dr. John Bradamus and Dr. Lynn Brown. An insider's account of how our laws are made, the book traces the evolution of national policy for education from the years 1959 to 1980, a period of intense struggle over the scope and the direction of federal support for America's schools and their students. It is a story told from the perspective of one of the key players in the legislative drama, former congressman and now president of New York University, Dr. John Bradamus. Writing with political scientist Lynn Brown, Dr. Bradamus has produced a fascinating account of the personalities, the processes, and the politics that have shaped education policy for much of the last quarter century. They also provide their views on recent trends in federal policy for education, including a sharp assessment of the damage done by the Reagan administration in this era. Before turning to questions, let me say just a bit more about our two authors. John Bradamus is no sideline observer of either politics or education. He has been in the thick of both worlds for his entire professional life. He was a practicing politician for 22 years, serving in the United States Congress from 1959 to 1981 as a representative from the 3rd District of Indiana, the home, among others, of the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. Throughout his time in the House of Representatives, he was a member of the Education and Labor Committee, the panel charged with the principal responsibility for education legislation, and he has had, therefore, a hand in writing most of the laws passed in the 1960s and 1970s concerning elementary and secondary education, higher education, services for the elderly and handicapped, as well as support for libraries, museums, arts, and the humanities. Congressman Bradamus was also a leader of his party, serving from 1977 to 1981 as the majority whip, the third-ranking uh, officer uh, in the House of Representatives. Then in 1981, he became president of New York University, the nation's largest private university, and in that role has been actively concerned about the education of the nearly 47,000 students that comprise NYU today. Recognized as a leading national spokesman for education and the arts, Dr. Bradamus serves on numerous civic and corporate boards. He's a graduate of Harvard University, he was also a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, where he completed the doctoral in social sciences. Dr. Lynn Brown is a graduate of Smith College and received her Ph.D. in political sciences from the Johns Hopkins University. She worked with John Bradamus when he was majority whip of the House and later for Thomas Foley uh, when he assumed that position in 1981. Dr. Dr. Brown has written extensively on the Congress and her particular area of expertise, party leaders in that branch of our federal government. She has been at New York University since 1981, where she currently serves as director of the university's Office of Writing, Research, and Edi Ed Ed Editorial Services. She is also an adjunct professor in the Political Science Department. To lead in our questioning today, we are <clears throat> joined by two other members of the New York University faculty. First, the chairman of New York University's Department of Journalism, Professor Terry Brooks, herself a career veteran of newspaper and reporting uh, fields for more than 20 years. Terry herself is an author of three books and over 100 articles in magazines and newspapers. Also joining us today is Professor Tony Samoez from our School of Education, Health, Nursing, and the Arts Professions. Professor Samoez is acting chair of the Bilingual Education and Foreign Languages program within that school, a respected authority in bilingual education, and the author of a new book, Moments in Culture. In addition, we are joined by a group of New York University students who will join us in our discussion with our two guest authors. I'd like to suggest that we divide our conversation into two parts. During the first segment, essentially concentrating on the legislative career of John Bradamus and the issues that he and Dr. Brown write about in the early days uh, of his career in Congress and the issues that affected ed education policy making during that period. And then during the second half of our conversation, focus a bit on more recent events. John, I wonder if to start off, remembering that it's been eight years now since you moved from Washington, D.C. to Washington Square, the home of New York University, if you'd say a few words about uh, the two lives you've led, uh, that of a congressman and that of a university president. Well, Harvey, I like to say that there's not really all that much difference, with a couple of important exceptions, in that uh, a university president 
like a member of Congress, raises money, uh, makes speeches, does television interviews, uh, deals with an extraordinary diversity of constituencies at a university, trustees, faculty, deans, vice presidents, benefactors, the, the media. Uh, in addition, a university president has to resolve conflicts, has to from time to time wrestle with massive egos, uh, and in short, the life of, of a congressman is very like that of a university president. The two big differences uh, between the two worlds, however, are these. One, a university president need not run every two years for re-election, as a member of the United States House of Representatives must do, and that's a very significant difference. And the other is that a university president is the chief executive officer of a large, in the case of New York University, enterprise. In our case, our university's operating budget for the year ahead will exceed $1 billion, and we have perhaps some 15,000 employees uh, at the university, perhaps 5,000 of them professional, uh, professionally educated uh, men and women. And that means a university president must be preoccupied far more than a member of Congress with fiscal and budgetary concerns. So those are the two, those are the uh, outlines of uh, the similarities and the, and the differences. And I feel very much uh, at home, therefore, in Washington Square, having lived over two decades of my life in Washington, D.C. Focusing on the Washington, D.C. part for just a few minutes here, I wonder if you'd say a little bit to our viewers about what drew you into politics in the first place and uh, what shaped your interest in education in particular. The reasons uh, for my interest in politics and in education are uh, not all that dissimilar. In the first place, I'm the son of a Greek immigrant, and my father brought his children up to believe that the most important legacy he could leave us was a first-class education rather than a lot of money, and that indeed proved to be the case. <laughs> Second, my mother uh, is a retired Indiana school teacher who taught in the public schools of my native state in Michigan for nearly half a century, and her parents in turn were uh, uh, university uh, educated. A, a, my grandfather on my mother's side was a, a college teacher, a high school superintendent. And so our family uh, grew up thinking that education was, was central. In addition, my father uh, brought me up to believe that politics uh, was invented by the Greeks and that uh, some of us still ought to practice it. Another very important factor, I think, in my deciding to go into politics was uh, that I grew up in the Methodist Church, which is a church with a very strong tradition in the United States of social concern, social responsibility. And then I had the opportunity to study at uh, the University of uh, Mississippi in my freshman year with a Navy suit on, a sailor suit uh, on in the ROTC. And that shook me greatly when I saw the segregation practiced in Mississippi uh, all those years ago. And then I had the chance to study at both Harvard and Oxford and those opportunities uh, stimulated my, my interest in, in public life still more. So for all of those reasons, uh, I decided that a career in elective politics was, was what I wanted. And after uh, three tries, I lost the first two, worked for a year for Adlai Stevenson in his second presidential campaign between two of the elections and was a college teacher between uh, uh, one and another. I was finally elected in 1958 and served 22 years. You mentioned in your book, The Politics of Education, that uh, education itself is not a particularly hot topic on Capitol Hill, and yet you have always, from the beginning of your service there, felt uh, that you were drawn to it, committed to education issues, and wanted to, to combine politics and education. Why specifically education and not other related fields of politics and culture or history. Well, Terry, I think one of the reasons is uh, something to which I've already alluded. I had the opportunity, uh, though I came of a, of a family, not a, a wealthy family, to study at uh, two of the greatest universities in the world, and that opened doors of opportunity for me uh, to go into Congress, uh, for example, so that when I arrived in Congress, uh, I felt that I had an obligation to try to open those doors to an education for other people. So I was on the Committee on Education and Labor uh, from the years of President Eisenhower through Kennedy uh, Johnson and took part in all the great society programs which involved elementary secondary education, uh, Head Start, uh, college student aid programs, the Guaranteed Student Loan Program, 
and uh, I felt that was uh, essential to the future of our of our country, to the quality of life of the people of our country, to uh, making the American dream come true, uh, if you will. And though it's been some time now, nearly a decade since I served in Congress, I still feel the same way about it, and I have the same attitude toward my responsibility as president of New York University. Brown, you want to add? Well, and actually, when, when John first uh, arrived on Capitol Hill, education was a hot issue. It was the year after Sputnik had been launched, and that occasioned the National Defense Education Act, which was really the first of the edifice of, of stones that were constructed to have the federal government involved more actively in education. And in fact, John uh, tells the story in the book when he was a newly minted congressman, not even uh, arrived yet, uh, used the period between his election in November and going to Washington in January to visit the then Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn, who lived in uh, Bonham, Texas, and John was there to press his case for the committee assignment he wanted. And he said he wanted education and labor, and Rayburn's response was, hazardous committee, hazardous committee. Yeah. Because it was at that time a volatile mix of uh, both personalities and politics. So I think education has uh, ebbed and flowed in its hotness, but in 1958-59 it was pretty hot. Mm -hmm. And after all, George Bush said as vice president in his campaign, that he wanted to be an education president, so uh, he must have had some sense from his reading of the public opinion polls that education is very important to the to the American people. Or do you think he's trying to make amends for what Reagan ha has? He'll have a long way to go to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, read, reading your book brought back memories in terms of the the war on poverty, um, the Kennedy era, the Sputnik era, and so forth. And I was just interested if you could compare both of you could compare. That era, the feelings you had working in Congress, the expectations, the ideals, and so forth, and comparing that to 1989 or the decade of the 80s, which seems to, um, it seems there's no commitment in terms of poverty, the handicapped, and other kind of things. What kind of feelings at that time were there in Congress the, the, of, of, of expectations mm -hmm. and other kinds of uh, ideas and ideals? Well, I think that both uh, Presidents Kennedy and uh, Johnson uh, were very different from uh, certainly from President Reagan, in, in their commitments. Uh, both of them had a sense of, uh, of justice, if you will. They both uh, felt that uh, the United States was a nation uh, that uh, was still in the making and there, were, there should be open doors of, of opportunity uh, to people of every uh, kind of background. And uh, the Peace Corps was a result of that. Uh, I've mentioned Project Head Start, the various college student aid programs. In addition, there was a lively interest uh, in, in culture, in the arts and humanities, and it was under President Johnson in 1965 that the National Arts and hum Humanities Endowments programs were created. When President Kennedy was in Washington, there was a great sense of elan. It was a lively, sprightly time. It was fun to be, uh, to be there. You felt it in the air. And after his tragic assassination, uh, President Johnson came in and picked up the the, the, the fight for civil rights. You must remember that it was just 25 years ago that the voting, that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, and it'll be 25 years, I guess, next uh, year that we mark the passage of the Voting Rights Act, both of which made major revolutions in the way in which we uh, deal with, uh, with each other in the American society. Uh, those were exciting times when the ideals of the country were more intimately linked with the political policies of the highest officials of our land, in my judgment. Then, then, of course, the Vietnam War came along, and that destroyed many of Lyndon Johnson's hopes. He thought he could make war and fight poverty at the same time without raising taxes, and obviously that was not possible. In the last several years, in my judgment, and since you asked me, I will respond, I think we've seen a, a different attitude in, in the highest office in the land, uh, much more uh, materialistic, uh, much more uh, uh, hostile to the idea that we have any sense of responsibility for one uh, another, uh, much more hostile to the idea that government should have any role whatsoever to play uh, in the life of our country. And I'm pleased to see that uh, President Bush seems to be moving away in a variety of ways from that almost ideological contempt for government that uh, characterized President Reagan's uh, service. Uh, so uh, I hope the new president uh, will, will 
uh, reach out and f follow more moderate, uh, open-minded policies than did his predecessor. Which of the uh, pieces of legislation you worked on in Congress are you now, in retrospect, uh, most proud of and, and which do you felt has endured the best? Oh, that's a hard one to say. I'll, I'll just rattle off two or three. I'm very proud of having written the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, which opened the doors uh, of, uh, to education for a lot of handicapped children in our society. I'm, I'm proud to have helped write the college student aid programs that make it possible for some of our students, uh, many of our students at New York University, to study. And there's one that I say to you as the chair of our Department of Journalism and Mass Communications that may be of interest to you. Uh, I was the House author with Senator Sam Irvin in the Senate of the legislation that in 1974 nullified President Ford's agreement to give former President Nixon all the tapes and papers of the Nixon administration and within five years make a bonfire of them uh, had he chosen to do so. I thought that was an offense against history, an outrage, and without telling you the whole story, uh, we wrote the legislation that said no, those papers, those tapes uh, were saved by Mr. Nixon, so he said for history we shall preserve them for history and they are now the property of the American people and I'm very proud of that. Can I just say, uh, the, your book is entitled The Politics of, Politics of Education. I'd like to look at time again and look at the 1980s and we have the Carnegie uh, Report, the Nation at Risk Report, uh, the Holmes Group, where basically they're, I guess the responses to our uh, failure of urban schools and other kinds of um, uh, problems we have. What, what kind of role do you see the federal government playing in, in these issues? Uh, uh, is, it, is it important to go back to the, the kind of attitude of the 60s to, to, uh, to intervene, uh, uh, to help, help, again, the students at risk, if you will? Or well, should, what should we do? In the first place, Tony, the federal government puts up very little money in terms of the overall percentage of uh, public spending on elementary, secondary education. Lynn, what is it, 6 or 7 percent, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think the federal government has these roles. It should, the, gov the federal government should provide funds to help at risk or disadvantaged students, such as, for example, uh, Chapter 1 of the Elementary Secondary Education Act provision for students from low-income uh, families and uh, the Education for Handicapped Children uh, legislation. I think the government has a responsibility to support uh, research into uh, how we can uh, teach uh, better and how we can uh, learn better. Um, I think the the fundamental costs of elementary and secondary education should be borne uh, by the local and state governments, however. Uh, so those are some observations. Lynn, do you want to add anything to that? Well, certainly, in terms of dollars and cents, the federal role is small, and it plays uh, itself out on the margins, but as most educators agree, those margins can be very significant. Um, and getting money at the right areas, at the right, focused on the right groups, uh, you're an expert on bilingual education. Most of those initiatives have been funded at the federal level, mm -hmm. I believe. And so that can, uh, may a thousand flowers bloom at the local and state level once you have that kind of seed money coming from the federal government. And also, I think leadership is an important role. Now, under the Reagan administration, we had a secretary of education who clearly saw the value of the bully pulpit before him. John and I felt that he did not use it in the way we would have used such a bully, bully pulpit. Uh, but there is no substitute for messages from the highest reaches of the federal government saying education is important, we value it, and we're ready to put our money where our aspirations are. Let me add are. two others to what Lynn has said. I think that the federal government should support uh, education at the elementary, secondary level in areas of national need, such as science, mathematics, and foreign languages and also where there are very serious problems. One of great concern to our country right now has to do with the abuse of dangerous drugs. Uh, we at New York University are helping the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Princeton lead a, an operation called Fighting Back, the purpose of which is to put over a period of several years some $27 million into middle-sized American communities to help them develop community-wide approaches to reducing demand for Ill illegal drugs and alcohol, which means basically education and treatment. This resonates with me because 20 years ago, Tony, in my subcommittee, I opened hearings on the Drug Abuse Education Act of 1969, not 79, not 89, and we wrote that into law. 
and I remember pleading with President Nixon to sign it. He was against it at the outset. He signed it, but we haven't put much money into it. One other area uh, that I'll just mention, Terry, uh, that I'm proud of, though we didn't succeed, is that 15 years ago, then Senator Mondale and I wrote the Comprehensive Child Development Bill, which was the first major effort to provide daycare opportunities for both uh, low- and middle-income families. Unfortunately, though Congress passed it, President Nixon vetoed it, but I'm glad to see that President Bush is now talking about it. I wonder, I wonder if, before we turn to our students, of staying on this theme, you'd say just a little bit more about among and between the branches of the federal government. Uh, say a word or two about the role of the Congress in initiating uh, versus uh, other responsibilities. Well, certainly one of the sub-themes of the book is that Congress counts. And uh, despite conventional wisdom often that only the White House is the font of all policy initiatives in domestic policy generally and in education, that is a misperception. And if you take the years 1959 to 1980, Congress had a co-equal and in many cases a dominant role in coming up with the ideas that were then enshrined in legislation, some of which John has spoken about. Um, the, the student grants, the first basic grant structure put in place was done by a senator, Senator Powell. And that is, they still bear his name, Pell Grants. Um, the Nash, we talk in the book about the National Institute of Education initiative, which was to use federal funds to help support research efforts. Now, President Nixon had floated the idea at the instigation of a then staff aide, I believe, called Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh -huh. Uh, but he wasn't going anywhere mm. with it fast, and it, well, it fell to people like John Bradamus and, and his colleagues to push it in the Congress. Uh, so we, in looking at those years, characterize Congress's role. We pick up the uh, lingo of psychologists and say Congress in our system acts in a passive-aggressive way that uh, it can cause enough trouble by laying back and not doing what you want that the executive branch has to pay attention to it. But often enough, it is uh, spurred by entrepreneurial and activist legislators like John to really craft out um, innovative policy areas and uh, pass laws. So Congress has a big role to play. I wonder if we might broaden the uh, circle of our conversation here a little bit. Uh, we're joined by a group of New York University students. I wonder if I could just ask you as a courtesy to Drs. Bradamus and Brown if you would uh, come to the mic and uh, identify yourself by name and perhaps the program that you're affiliated with here and put your question to either or both of them. Someone want to uh, lead off? Yeah. Uh, I'm Glenn Selig. I'm in the Department of Journalism. I was wondering, not coming from a wealthy family, you must be able to empathize the increased burdens of uh, the cost of education, especially in the city university system. What solace can you offer those people that can't afford an education today? Shall I comment, Lynn? Well, first, and then I'll right. uh, The solace that one can offer people who are talented and able to win admission to college and university but don't have the financial resources uh, is that the United States of America, to an extent far greater than any other country in the world, has developed an array of resources available to such students. Uh, we have the College Work Study Program, the Guaranteed Student Loan Program. We have the Pell Grant Program. We have the so-called Perkins Program, the old National Direct Student Loan Program. New York University itself uh, provides uh, millions of dollars to students for financial assistance from university resources. In New York State, there are various uh, scholarship programs, not nearly so large, uh, that also help. Uh, students, uh, some, I suppose, 80% of the students at New York University today, undergraduates, have jobs of some kind. Uh, and you put all of those pieces together, and you can, you can pay for a college education in the United States today. There's no other country in the world that uh, has uh, gone to such effort to say, come study. You have to work for it, but you can do it. If I could just follow up on that, though. What about the, the growing middle class, or the actually shrinking middle class in this country? It seems that if you're very poor, you qualify for the Pell Grant and all those other programs. And if you're very rich, you have no problem. But if you're somehow caught in the middle, that's those people that are being hardest hit in our system. What can be done? Well, that's one of the reasons that uh, my colleagues in Congress and I wrote something that we call the Middle Income Student Assistance Act, 
because we were both aware substantively of the problem to which you address yourself, and we were aware politically of the problem uh, that you, uh, of which you speak. When I was in college, there were four, four of us in my family who were in college. We were a middle-income family. We were all able to go to college. I had the GI Bill. I had a scholarship from the university that I attended. I worked in the summer. My parents gave me some money, and that's how we, that's how we did it. And you can still do that today, except that today there are even more opportunities. So I think the opportunities uh, are, are there. Uh, if you think it's difficult in our country, you ought to see how hard it is to study in Great Britain, for example, where only a handful of people compared to us have a chance to go to college. Thank you. I, Lynn? Just, I also think this, um, clearly, though, the problem of uh, cost of education outpacing ability to pay has spawned, though, some very creative ideas that I think just now are being looked at and have to be looked at carefully. I think of the, the prepayment tuition plans that many of the states are experimenting with. And even at university level, and I believe this is true at NYU, um, developing a capability within financial aid offices, really getting into financial planning and trying to come up with creative ways to have families and students look at this problem long range and, and uh, devote resources to it. I think the concern of anyone who has been involved as an architect in the original fabric of programs is just to make sure that what ain't broke, let's not fix. Let's look at what still remains unmet need and come up with solutions for that. But let's not uh, do away with the programs that have already allowed, as John said, millions and millions of people in this country, the means for an education. Another question from our student group, please. I was, <clears throat> I was just wondering how much damage you think, in a long-term basis, the Reagan administration has done, and how it will affect us in the 1990s, and if you think that the Bush administration will make that much of a difference. Well, uh, you know, in the House of Representatives, we have what we call the one-minute rule. Uh, and it would take me much longer than one minute to uh, respond to your question. I'm deeply distressed about the gigantic budget deficit that is going to plague you uh, when you leave university, that is a, a consequence, in my opinion, of the fiscal and economic policies pursued over the last several years. I'm distressed in respect of universities at the hostility of the past administration to aid to college students, at the failure of the administration to invest sufficiently to confine ourselves to higher education in facilities for research and instruction, laboratories, uh, equipment, uh, very dangerous to our competitive position in the increasingly globalized international economy, and in my opinion, dangerous as well to our national security, to our capacity to conduct an effective foreign policy and national security policy. So I suppose I'd have to say in all candor, I, th I think we're going to be paying uh, for many years to come for uh, many of the foolish uh, and, and short-sighted policies that have been uh, inflicted on our country in the last several years. Is that plain enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take a break here for five minutes. And Dr. Bradamus, in your book, uh, The Politics of Education, you talk about some of the areas where universities are particularly deficient now. Um, and one of the, them that you mentioned particularly is the area of science and mathematics. Um, at another point, you allude to how education ties in with defense, the defense of our country. I wondered if you could explain exactly how these two areas merge two or three comments. Uh, first of all, if you take the size of the Defense Department budget right now, which is in the neighborhood of $300 billion, it seems to me obvious that we cannot intelligently, effectively expend such enormous sums of money without highly trained, 
very well educated men and women in the fields of engineering, science, management, economics, and those people will have to come from the universities. I speak not only of the expenditure of monies on the military services, but on the, uh, the contracts that are, that are required to be performed uh, for uh, weapon systems and all of that. Uh, second, uh, essential to our national security is an effective uh, foreign policy apparatus. We need uh, highly trained, professionally educated men and women to serve as, as diplomats. And we need, in my opinion, uh, to pay much more attention to the teaching of, of foreign languages for people uh, in, in that uh, particular uh, career. So far as science and mathematics is, uh, are concerned, to return to that, uh, today national security is founded in large measure on scientific and technological capability. And those are the simple straightforward reasons that we have to uh, in, invest uh, far more, I think, than we've been doing uh, in science and math. And in this respect, I'll say two other things. I was pleased to see that uh, President Bush appointed uh, Professor Alan Bromley of Yale, who had co-chaired with David Packard, the former Secretary of Defense, a White House panel under the Reagan administration that had urged a substantial increase in investment in science and mathematics education, in basic research, in, in facilities, laboratories, equipment, the infrastructure uh, for scientific and, and technological education. So uh, I hope he is persuasive uh, with, uh, with President Bush. How far behind are we really in this area? Is it a question of staying caught up or are we really dramatically behind Japan, say, and other countries in these I'll these respond areas? in two ways. One, I think the answer is uneven. We certainly are behind in some, in some areas. Uh, for example, to take an obvious one that all of us as consumers understand, I think there's only one company left in the United States that makes television sets uh, anymore. Uh, but I am serving as a member of what's called the Carnegie Commission on Science, Technology, and Government, which is located at New York University, uh, co-chaired by Joshua Lederberg, president of the Rockefeller University, a Nobel laureate, and William Golden, who is the chairman of the advisory council to the Quran Institute of Mathematics at NYU. On this commission are former President Jimmy Carter, uh, two former science advisors to Presidents Kennedy and Ford, uh, another Nobel laureate, the President of Stanford, and others. And it is our responsibility to study in the years immediately upcoming, and we're engaged in it even as we speak, the implications for government policy of developments in science and technology. So if you ask me this question, Terry, in about a year, I'll be able to give you, I hope, a much more informed uh, answer. Uh, but it's serious, it's profound, and I'm very pleased that New York University is going to be directly engaged in an effort to understand this issue. This issue. I would like to follow up. Uh, I remind again the Sputnik era, where we had math and science. We also had foreign languages as a concept of the 60s, and uh, and Senator Simon in, in the 70s and 80s have been has been uh, uh, supporting foreign language education. But there seems to be uh, an anti-language. Uh, um, attitude uh, recently that uh, the English only movement for example is, is very very strong many states are passing laws against uh, uh, teaching in, in other languages and so forth what are your views in terms of, again looking at the Sputnik era the the idea of foreign languages is very very um, uh, the positive uh, environment uh, in terms of national defense and so forth and what's happened in the 1980s of, uh, in terms of languages. Two or, two or three comments quickly as Lynn Brown and I point out in our book uh, I wrote in 1966 the International Education Act, 1966, not 76 or 86, the purpose of which was to provide federal funds to colleges and universities in the United States to encourage the study of foreign languages and, and cultures. Unfortunately, Congress never put much money into that. I think that's one of the reasons we got into so much trouble in, in Vietnam and have been so much trouble in Iran and Central America and other hot spots of the, of the world because we, we haven't been sophisticated enough in our knowledge of those cultures. At New York University, I'm proud to say, we've been making substantial investments in the study of, let's say, Western European areas. Uh, we have the uh, marvelous program in French culture and civilization. We have the Onassis Center for Hellenic Studies. We have the uh, Casa Italiana Zarili Marimo. Uh, we have the King Juan Carlos I Chair in Spanish culture and civilization. 
We have the Deutsches Haus program. We have the Skirball Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies. We have the Kevorkian Institute of Near Eastern Studies. And in the Stern School of Business, we have the U.S.-Japan Center for Business and Economic Studies. So we've made a judgment at this university that we are going to afford our students an opportunity to understand other cultures because we think it's essential to the, the future economic strength of our country as well as to our national mm -hmm. uh, security. One other point, and then I want to yield to Lynn, as we say in the House of Representatives. <laughs> uh, I think it's imperative that people growing up in the American society learn how to read, write, speak, and understand the English language well. It is the dominant language. But I also am a strong advocate of learning a second language because that gives you a new pair of eyeglasses with which to see and understand the world. And I think foreign languages provides some of the nexus you were talking about, Professor Brooks, between education and defense. On another project John and I worked on, which was a report on graduate education, we interviewed um, many people from the highest reaches of government, two former directors of the CIA, not the one who's president now. And it was chilling to hear them say that one of the great lacks they had in, in directing their agencies was not being able to find people sufficiently um, trained, uh, not only in the languages, but in the culture and sociology and religion and history of areas of the world where they could see potential trouble spots, or even where they were not a trouble spot yet, but could be. Who, who 10 or 20 years ago would have thought Granada or the Falklands, or in the early 60s we were caught short, obviously in this area in Vietnam. And so I think education in these matters too is a scattershot proposition. You cannot always ask for the investment up front to pay for itself and say, I can see a need and we definitely need someone for this XYZ country. We don't know what countries will be important. We don't know what areas of the world are. And that's why you should put money into these programs and make sure the people are there in the pipeline when we need them. I have a, a question for Dr. Brown. Also, it's um, difficult for the layperson who has children going into college or currently in college to think of ways in which they could be effective in guaranteeing that their child, particularly, particularly people from middle income or lower income groups, um, that they could find ways to be specifically helpful to their own relatives who they want to be sure have a quality, you know, high class education. How can someone who looks at the annual tuition costs or looks at the cost of their child going into the college instead of the labor market right away. How can, what can those people do? You mean financially? In terms, in terms of, of what could they do um, politically in Washington or financially for themselves? Or how does one guide I'm on firmer ground talking about politically than financially. Okay, let's <laughs> start with politically. <laughs> but it does follow one of the questions that the students brought up too when she was talking about uh, as a graduate student seeing her um, tuition benefits taxed, and um, at that time I thought of it, and your question allows me the chance to speak about it too. Um, it's very important not just to talk about this with each other and with members of the university administration who already are uh, on your side, so to speak. The audience to talk to are, those pe are the people in Washington. Make your views known and let the, let, uh, the legislators in Washington know how these um, the laws they pass are affecting you. There is no substitute, and John knows this better than I, um, to a communication from a constituent who relates an abstract policy to their life as they live it day by day and says, you hurt me, or you helped me, thank you, which is also important to those who do help, but you hurt me as well. So one thing I, I think is to recognize that education is affected by politics, it is affected by what goes on in Washington, pay attention and write your congressman. And so an individual letter is read, is noticed by the senator or representative? Well, I'll defer. Uh, oh, it, cer but, it, cer uh, it certainly is. I'll give you an example even uh, closer to home. Uh, earlier this year, students, faculty, staff, and alumni from New York University journeyed to Albany, to the capital of our state of New York, to express our concern about what we feared would be very substantial cuts in New York State tax dollars coming to 
higher education generally in the state and to New York University in general. We stood to lose uh, several millions of dollars. I'm very pleased to say that as a result, I believe in, in part, in significant part, of the effective lobbying on the part of, of particularly of our students, Harvey, uh, we, we won the fight and uh, our legislators responded. And, uh, and that's a ter terrific example of, of how uh, we, we can make an impact on, uh, on the people whom we choose to represent us in public office. And I take my hat off to the students again. They were, they were terrific. Let's turn again to uh, some of our students here uh, present and uh, ask uh, if we can continue their dialogue with us. Please. Uh, yes, hello. Um, my name is Edison Sannon. Um, I'm a journalism major. Um, my question would be for both Dr. Brown and Dr. Bradamus. Um, do you believe that uh, with the way how education has been going lately, would you feel that we might have to adopt the poli policies of, say, um, Japan and China, the way how college education is a very important factor in their lives? Or do you feel that we could still go on with the same plan and it's just a matter of adding more money towards education so that we can bring back the competitive edge as you were talking about? Uh, global competitiveness. Well, I'll, I'll take a quick stab and yield to Lynn. First, uh, I think that the attitude toward higher education in the United States is rather different from that in Japan. Japanese students, uh, to generalize, work very hard in grade school and high school. Once they get to college and university, they don't work as hard as university students do in our country. And it's often been said that our country produces many more Nobel laureates than, than the Japanese do. Uh, nonetheless, we can learn from the Japanese, I think, a sense of discipline, of hard work, particularly in respect of learning the basics in mathematics and in, and in science, uh, lessons that uh, are, are not uh, learned by a lot of American uh, students today. So I wouldn't want to adopt the Japanese system for our country, but I would want to take some uh, lessons uh, from them. Yes, I think it's ironic that in this country we have a spate of reports bemoaning the state of elementary and secondary education, some of which is warranted. Um, in Japan, they have done some studies bemoaning the, the, that they do not hold up as well in the higher education realm mm -hmm. compared to the United States. So I think our system of higher education is probably the envy of the world on two fronts, on both access, as John alluded to earlier. Um, in even most Western European countries, a very small percentage of students who finish high school go on to college. I think it's on the order of 10, 13 percent, and compare that with something like 80 percent in this country. In terms of access and in terms of excellence, um, one of the things the Japanese are beginning to look at is are they produce, is their higher education system too stultifying? Does it allow for the kind of creativity, independent study, the kinds of things that, that make you a creative and successful person after you leave college? So, as John said, there are things to learn both ways, but I would not be prepared in, in any way to start dismantling our higher education system and follow either Japan or China, and China's a whole other story right now. Um, uh, I do think ke keeping money, uh, that's why the, f the role of the federal government is important, though, to main maintain both that access and the excellence. Uh, just one other question. Um, how soon do you think uh, pr it will take for President Bush to implement his plans on education? He's behind already, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, President Bush uh, promised in uh, Indianapolis, my native state, that he wanted to be, he said he wanted to be an education president. And he said during his campaign that he would uh, unequivocally assert that he would not reduce total federal spending for education. So I was distressed, as were a lot of my colleagues, when in his first budget he uh, proposed in respect of money for education uh, to reduce, if you take into account inflation and interest rates, uh, by one billion dollars total federal spending for, for education. He asked for about four hundred million dollars plus in new initiatives for education, but he failed to point out that to implement them, monies would have to be taken out of other education programs. So I think it's fair to say that he's, uh, he's off to a shaky start and he may find himself confronted by both Republicans and Democrats in Congress who say, Mr. President, you say you want to be an education president. We just want you to know you're dealing with an education Congress. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Other, yes, ma'am. 
Yes, my name is Madeline Barchevska, and I'm a recent graduate in the master's uh, category from Gallatin in state direction, and I also work here at the university, worked my way through school. Um, my question is uh, about broadcasting for children, uh, children's programming, and Dr. Bradamus, you've been a tremendous proponent for the positive aspects of this um, and uh, it's been a very, very negative climate up till now. People have been doomsayers about the corrosive aspects of broadcasting on, and children's programming up to this point. Where do we stand now? What has been the recent research or experimentation? And is there any way um, that has been developed for uh, promoting literacy in children through television pro programming? Well, those are two huge questions, and I certainly don't pretend to uh, be an authority on, uh, on either of those subjects. Uh, I will say, having uh, criticized uh, President uh, Bush for not uh, being a forceful enough proponent in his uh, policies uh, of, of education, uh, I want to tip my hat to Mrs. Bush, to Barbara Bush, who I think has uh, done a terrific job of alerting the country to the importance of combating uh, literacy, Ill illiteracy. Uh, and that's a, that's a shame uh, in a country as great and rich as ours that we still have millions of people who are functionally illiterate. So I think we have to work very hard uh, on that, uh, not only with federal monies, but with state monies, local monies, and in the private sector. So far as uh, children's television is concerned, um, I think it's, uh, it's an issue that's uh, up in the air again. Uh, uh, there have been changes uh, on the Federal Communications Commission and with those changes come differing attitudes on the part of the commissioners toward how much license, as it were, how much, uh, f uh, how much leeway they will allow uh, the networks to use violence in particular on those Saturday morning uh, children's shows. Uh, I, d I don't like censorship. I don't like to see that. Uh, on the other hand, the airways are not the property of the networks. They are the property of the American people. That's why we have the Federal uh, Communications Commission. So I hope that there will be, uh, and we've already seen, as a matter of fact, earlier in the year, uh, some uh, public reaction to advertisements uh, and to programming uh, that have been held by viewers as, as being uh, inimical to the interests of children. There's been so much clamor that some of the networks have, uh, have, have responded and have pulled back some of the programming and some of the advertisers, which is really getting you where it hurts, have uh, said, no, we're not gonna have that kind of advertising if you're gonna run that kind of a, of a, of a program. So I think uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, we, we can hold out some uh, cautious hope. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Silvia Villa Davila, and I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Education. Uh, President Bradimas, uh, faced all the challenges for learning that you mentioned in your book, how do you see the role of the university in shaping education for the next century? And how can the university marshal the resources and support needed uh, to influence or impact the politics and government? Well, that's an enough easy for question. Two, that's enough for two, uh, two, two speeches. Uh, f first of all, as uh, Lynn and I say in our book, uh, universities can have a very powerful impact on the public schools in that uh, we draw, we, we educate the teachers who teach in the public schools, and we also are the pace setters in terms of what is taught. The, the curricular uh, cues, we say, are taken from the universities. We're deeply engaged at New York University with the public schools of New York City in a wide variety uh, of, of ways. In terms of preparing for the challenges of the next generation, I've already, uh, as, have, as has Lynn, suggested a number of the ways in which we feel we're doing it when we talked about our area studies programs, uh, for, uh, for example. The other point about marshaling resources, I would say uh, the following. Universities are so important to the future of this country that we need support from state government, from the federal government, from uh, private sources, private foundations, from uh, alumni of the universities. We need support from a variety of sources. We are now driving to raise $1 billion for New York University by the year 2000, beginning about uh, 1983 
To do that, we must, in the year 1989, raise over $2 million a week. And I'm pleased to say that we are doing that. It's imperative, therefore, that uh, everyone who is listening to us on this program uh, support the college or university uh, from which he or she graduated, or whether he or she went to a college or university, it's in the interest of our entire society that you give uh, financially to your university. And my office address is 70 Washington <laughs> Square South, and I'd be very glad to have you uh, send in a contribution uh, payable to New York University, and you'll help New York University help respond to the challenges you've so uh, eloquently voiced. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Time pushes on. We have qu time for one more question from our students. Yeah. In your book, you discuss the Bowen and Schuster survey, American Professors and National Resources Imperiled, which mentions the need for greater faculty commitment to teaching. And I'd appreciate it if you would address the issue of university professors and the quality of their teaching abilities versus the quantity of their publications <coughs> and what should be deemed more valuable to higher education. Well, I think that the teaching versus research argument is, is a bit of a straw man, actually. I've, I've never seen them as mutually exclusive, is my own view, both as someone who spent a lot of time in the classroom on the sitting end. Uh, I always thought those professors who were most vibrant, um, most involving in the classroom, were often the ones who, of course, were on the cutting edge of their own research. And the same was the true, that, that uh, the research you conduct is often spurred on and shaped by the interests of your, your students. Um, and so I never, I don't think, see it at all as an either-or proposition. I think universities are places where first-class research is conducted, which includes lit uh, re uh, scholarship and literature. It's also places where that knowledge is passed on to students. Um, but don't you think a lot of professors are hired um, just because of their scholarship and um, not because of their teaching abilities? Well, to the extent that uh, the way we train uh, for instance, the way you, you train people to go into a classroom at the elementary and secondary level, mm -hmm. there is certainly um, a high degree of, uh, of training in pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And the debate right now is, in fact, is it too much? Has the balance at the lower levels gone the other way and teachers are not as versed in their fields as they should be? At the higher education level, the debate seems to be the reverse, which is you have people who are well versed in their fields. and do they have the pro proper skills to teach classes. I think there's certainly some room for every graduate student or anyone who decides they want to spend the rest of their life in a classroom or at the college level. There is room for training in pedagogical techniques uh, and everyone benefits from that. Uh, but I don't think that in any way would keep them from being in the first in their field in their academic discipline. So uh, I'm... Uh, I come down squarely in the middle on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks for the question. I wonder if, by way of uh, sort of wrapping up here, we've talked a lot about the first title, you might say, of the, the book, the large, uh, the large print, but there is an interesting sort of uh, second line, conflict and consensus on Capitol Hill. And as we sort of exit this conversation, we think uh, across the country about the role of the legislative branch in the process of uh, policy making. If each of you would just say a little word about as, as you would have us think about the role of the Congress, particularly in the process of formulating public policy, uh, what would you have us uh, remember most? Well, as we celebrate, it's an appropriate question, this year we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the first Congress. Um, I think for all its faults, it is probably, uh, by any standard, the most remarkable exercise in representative government, institution of representative government ever devised. It is certainly uh, stood us in good stead, I think. It is that branch of the government closest to the people. And because of that, it is messy. And it does things in fits and starts. And it is not always very efficient. Uh, but I think, uh, as we say in the book, um, to paraphrase Voltaire, if it would, did not already exist, it would be necessary to invent it. And I'll defer to the uh, uh, someone who actually spent the greater part of his life in that institution for the final word. Well, I like to say that uh, having studied in England for a while and having sat uh, in the House of Commons uh, in the galleries uh, and having been a member of uh, the American Congress, 
I don't think I could really uh, be happy being a member of parliament. That is, I wouldn't be comfortable in a parliamentary situation because in our separation of powers constitution, uh, though, as Lynn has said, it's uh, complicated, difficult to operate, nonetheless, uh, individually elected men and women can have ideas of their own, can make a contribution to the shaping of public policy, and can play a very positive construct and constructive uh, role. Not only, however, as initiators of policy, but as overseers of the executive branch of the government mm -hmm. to be sure that the executive branch carries out the laws that Congress uh, wrote. So I conclude uh, my comments on a somewhat different tone, Harvey, with the following observation. And I say this having served on, uh, I conclude with the following observation, and I say this having served on the National Commission on the Public Service, chaired by Paul Volcker, charged with the job of developing recommendations for attracting able people to the career federal civil service. I hope more and more young people, as they plan their careers, will consider careers in the public service, either in the career public service, civil service, or, as I obviously decided to do, go into what my late mentor Adlai Stevenson called combat politics and put your name on the line and uh, run for public office and especially run for Congress because given the power of the United States, uh, it's very gratifying that you will have one voice and one vote in helping shape the destiny uh, of your country. So uh, I, I hope that some people who read uh, our book will be uh, motivated to decide to uh, go out and run for Congress someday. Indeed. Well, we've had a very lively, wide-ranging conversation, which I hope, uh, in the spirit of uh, John's last remarks, uh, suggests ways that you might uh, become engaged directly and uh, indirectly, as some of our earlier questions suggest, in the process of forming public judgments about one of the great issues of the day, uh, the quality of the educational system of our country and the availability of education to all of our citizens. I want to thank our guests, particularly our two guest authors, Dr. John Bradamus and Dr. Lynn Brown, for joining us. I want as well to thank members of our faculty and our students who really contributed greatly to this lively and informative discussion. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today for another edition of Author Author.